September 2018, I went to Miami and New York, which was my last holiday of that summer. So that was the point at which I decided I was pretty much done with being lean for the year and started eating whatever the fuck I wanted. Shortly after getting back on October the 15th, I officially started bulking by declaring that in the first episode of this bulking series because it's not official unless you make a YouTube announcement about it. So by this time, I'd already been in a slight surplus for around three or four weeks. But for all intents and purposes, this was day one of the bulk because YouTube. So over the next few months, I had a good, solid phase of training and eating, and by mid-Jan, I'd gained a good bit of weight, and some of that was uh, even muscle, so that's a good thing. Then life happened, completely for work purposes, entirely against my will, I was forced to go on an epic six-week trip of a motherfucking lifetime, and it was tough because, you know, I just wanted to stay home and focus on the bulk and make some minute muscle gains, but... Needs must. So, whilst I was away, I actually trained almost as frequently as I would have at home. I'd say for every five sessions I would do at home, I probably got four done whilst I was away. So, you could say my training frequency maybe dropped by around 20% roughly. Which isn't all that much, all things considered, especially with how frequently I was training beforehand. In general, I ate pretty well. I wasn't tracking, but it was mainly salads, a shit ton of sushi protein bars and then I also smashed a load of dates and nuts and avocados anytime I could just to try and keep calories high. My intention in an ideal world was to keep bulking but as a minimum I would just have been happy with getting back without actually having lost any gains. I think I managed that. Let's do a quick physique update and then we'll go into some actual body weights. Okay so on the left we have my final physique update from mid-January before leaving and on the right, we have current day. So I've altered the crop a couple of times just throughout this comparison, just because I move a little bit closer to the camera in one of the clips, and so I'm basically just trying to keep it fair so that my the top of my head and my waistband are kind of aligned across the two clips, just so I'm not actually stood closer in one of them. I'm trying to fake some gains, man. So let me know if you think there's any noticeable difference. Personally, I don't think there's anything major you might be able to nitpick things here and there but it could just be how i'm standing there's certainly not a big difference if any um, but i also i don't think i look in any worse shape on the right certainly not so yeah let me know what you think next i'm actually just gonna flick to a physique update from in the gym when i've actually got a pump partly to show you the difference but also because you're probably more used to seeing my physique in the gym when I'm training or right after training when I've got a bit of a pump. And so it might actually give you a better idea of where I'm at now relative to what you usually see from me. So this is after training and in some decent light. So just throwing it in there for some good measure, really. All right, all of a sudden we've got no top on, partly because this is fitness, but mainly because I live in a greenhouse. It's all glass, mate, and it's very warm. So we're rolling with that. Anyway, what I'm going to do is go through some body weights and also my muscle mass as calculated by the scales. So what they do is give you your weight, your body fat percentage, and also what is supposed to be the percentage of your weight, which is muscle. And so what I've done with that percentage is just turn it into an actual figure. So it's probably not particularly accurate, but I'm at least going off the assumption that it is a consistent degree of inaccurate, so at least it can gauge some kind of gains. So, let's do that. So back at the start, on October the 15th, I was 173.6 pounds, and according to the scales, 46.6% of that was muscle mass, giving a muscle mass of 80.9 pounds. Then I have figures from November, December, and the final weight before leaving, taken on January 18th, was 184 pounds with a muscle mass of 82.8 pounds. Fast forward to when I'm back after my trip, and the first time I got on the scales was March 22nd, and they told me I was 183.6 pounds, with a muscle mass percentage of 44.7, giving 82.1 pounds of muscle mass. So, a little bit disappointed. I thought, shit, man, I lost some gains. So, gave it a week, walked away from it, came back, got back on the scales. March 29th, I was 184.4 pounds, with 45% muscle mass, giving 83 pounds. 
of muscle mass, the highest yet recorded. So obviously the scales can't be that accurate because you don't just gain pretty much a pound of muscle mass in like six days. So one or both of those figures are wrong. Anyway, I took another reading the following day and I was 184 pounds with a muscle mass of 82.8 pounds, which basically puts me back at exactly where I was on the final weight before leaving. So because that's pretty consistent with the day before, I'm gonna assume that's roughly where I am and say pretty much fuck all has changed in that six weeks that I've been away, or it was actually a lot longer between the times I, I weighed myself, but. <coughs> I'm all right, so two and a bit months went by between those weights and I'm in exactly the same position. So obviously from a bulking standpoint, you can look at it and you, you can be like, Joe, you made no gains in two and a bit months, man. That's atrocious, lad. You're shit. Why is, even, why is anyone even subscribed to you? However, I'm going to flip that and be like, actually, I went on a fucking wild trip, like through like four or five different time zones, completely out of schedule and out of routine. You know, there was nothing predictable. Look at Rhea Delt popping, man. There was nothing predictable about it whatsoever and I managed to not lose any gains and all that whilst my actual body weight is I would say above what I naturally tend towards when I'm just like eating what I want training well you know I would say it's above my my natural kind of set point and so to maintain that I'm actually like pretty happy with that to be honest because if I can go on that kind of trip it, and not lose gains it essentially means like I'm pretty safe man like I think I've mastered it like, I think I can do whatever the fuck I want now and as long as I'm not a stupid motherfucker about it, I can get through it without losing gains, man. And uh, I feel like that's a good position to be in, you know. So I'm not gonna be disheartened about not making any gains over those two months because, you know, you have to have some kind of realistic expectations. Like, I've been training for 11 years and I've got probably decent slash slightly above average, but certainly not elite genetics. You know, I, I have never, and I'm not currently and will never probably take any performance enhancing drugs, you know? And so to expect to just continuously make fucking linear gains regardless of situation and everything else is probably unrealistic. You have to have some uh, actual sense of what, what your limits are. Uh, and so that seems to be mine in this situation, but all in all, I think that's sound, so. Okay, so that is about it for general physique updates and uh, bulking progress and all that kind of stuff. However, I also wanted to talk generally, or at least uh, give some advice on how to not lose gains whilst traveling. So obviously in keeping with the theme and in keeping with recent events in my life. So I've spoken generally about how to stay in shape whilst traveling before, but when I've done that in the past, it's usually been with a view to getting through your holiday whilst not gaining much if any excess fat so it's more like how to stay lean whilst traveling rather than how to make sure you don't lose any gains now obviously even if you are just attempting to stay lean or more focused on uh, the shreds let's say obviously you still have the goal of maintaining your muscle mass of course it's just you might be more focused on the kind of uh, body fat side of things now, because you're still trying to maintain size in both scenarios, the training considerations would be consistent regardless whether you're away and you're just trying to you know, stay lean or you're away and you're more bothered about like, ma maintaining as much size as possible. So whichever your priority is, the training side of things would be consistent and it's only really the diet side that might differ depending on your priority. Now, if you're unsure, of uh, where your priorities lie in that regard. I would say for the vast majority of us, it is far more important to make sure you get through that holiday or, or whatever it is. It might be three months in Thailand with the boys, whatever it is, I would say it's uh, it's more important for the, the vast majority of us who are working towards some kind of long-term physique goal that might be you know five or 10 years off, I'm sorry to say, much more important to retain that hard-earned muscle as opposed to 
just making sure you get through it and stay lean because if you think about the time it's going to take you to rectify any quote unquote damage done when you get home it's obviously a lot easier to just easier and quicker simply to just lose a bit of excess fat that you've gained than it is to you know regain like weeks months or years worth of size you know so that should be the general focus and uh, i'm going to go through some tips now let's do it all right number one stick to a set routine using primarily free weights and if possible barbell over dumbbell when you have the, the opportunity so a lot of these tips are going to circle back to making it easier to track your lifts or to track and maintain your lifts whilst you're away because that's going to be you know a real fucking key factor so the reason why i say use predominantly uh, free weights and barbells is because if you're training through different gyms and you don't know how well equipped they're going to be then you have to go with the basics really if your main vertical press was a hammer strength shoulder press machine you know you're pretty fucked when you get to the gym and it's not there and if you then have to switch your shoulder press to a different exercise it's hard for you to well it's, it's actually impossible for you to equate the weight you can't say oh well i do two plates aside on the on the hammer press so um you know i'm gonna press 40k dumbbells or, or whatever it is you can't really equate that across different exercises even if they are similar exercises because it's just not in practice it just does, does not work out like that and so having consistent exercises, at least for your main compound, so a horizontal push-pull and a vertical push-pull, and then a leg press slash squat movement. Keeping those exercises consistent is just gonna make it so much easier for you to be able to track your lifts. Number two, stick to a set rep range. Again, this is just with a view to being able to consistently track your lifts and be accountable to those weights that you lifted in your previous workout so if you're at home in general and if you're in a, a pretty solid predictable routine typically you would be following some kind of program that allows you to cycle through rep ranges or allow, allows you to hit various rep ranges whether that's within a week doing dup or whether it's uh, more staggered phases wh whatever it is and technically you could still do that whilst you're away right you could still follow a normal program in terms of like uh, how the rep ranges are periodized or, or whatever it is but i just feel like it would make it a little bit more difficult for you to consistently be able to track your lifts and obviously if you're having to go in you're going into a new gym and then you're having to reset your weights again this time for sets of six when you have been doing sets of ten i feel like it's just gonna overcomplicate things and uh, it's not gonna make it as easy as it would if you were to stick in in one rep range. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to only train in one rep range for all exercises, because if you think about it, you're never comparing your chest presses to your chest flies, are you? So it's only the specific exercises that have to remain consistent. So let's say I was doing a push workout. I could do my flat presses, sets of eight, and then I could do my flies, sets of 12 just so that i've at least covered different rep ranges and i'm not just doing sets of eight for every single exercise for the full time that i'm away all right number three obviously this is implied from both of the above but i just didn't want to go past it without saying track your lifts at least at the very least track push pull push pull and then your squat or leg press movement and if you're going to deadlift then deadlifts as well that's six lifts you know it's, it's not difficult to track six six lifts so just fucking do it it's the, that, that applies like obviously if you're at home or if you're away but that would that's just key factor man because it, it's all about keeping yourself accountable and not getting in there and being like oh i'm a bit jet lagged i might just like do fucking sets of 12 and just fuck about you know what i mean might just train for the burn today for the squeeze mate that's how you lose gains man you have to keep touching the weights all right so number four would be forget the notion of a week so i assume that your training frequency when you're away would be generally quite unpredictable and so it's not really any use to just decide on this seven day set period um within which you've got to get everything done so instead of having a program or, or whatever it is that is set up on a weekly basis as in like week one week two week three whatever i would just stick with a, a specific split and then just roll through it so let's say i'm doing an upper lower split and I can train three times one week and then twice the next week, I'll just do upper, lower, upper. And then the next week I'll start on lower 
and obviously just keep rolling around like that so just a week is a made up thing it might not be maybe there's some celestial fucking meaning to a week but it doesn't fucking matter it's, a week's not a thing for all intents and purposes you know all right number five so this kind of follows on from the previous point but it's, i'm calling it a separate point because more points equals just better in it being opportunist with with your training uh, if you get the chance to train, train because you don't know when you're going to get the next chance. I'm assuming. I'm assuming that it's going to be quite unpredictable. Um, and so I always prefer to get my sessions in when I know that I can because let's say I'm moving from one place to the next. And I don't know how easy it's going to be to find a gym in the next place or whatever. If I have to fucking get my sessions in in this one, then, you know, I'm, I'm going to feel a lot better about having three days off if I've just trained for like four days straight. Um, so... Train when you can, that's, I don't know if that's a tip, man. I don't know if that counts as a tip. I hope it's a tip. Uh, all right, all right, number six, this kind of follows on again, but in terms of your diet. So be an opportunist with your food. Now, I have found previously that um, it depends on what country you're in, but sometimes, especially in some parts of Europe, it's pretty hard to come to come by like a decent bit of protein. And you don't want it to get to like 9 p.m. and you be like, oh, fuck. Uh, I've still got to eat 50 grams of protein and I've just had my dinner and uh, now I'm going to have to go and buy some like suspicious packs of like reconstituted ham from some weird shop uh, it's just not how you want to live your life is it so you know if you're if you have the opportunity to just fucking overload on protein this to some sense this, go, this goes for calories as well do so because your total protein intake for the day is by far the most important thing and so if you're thinking about distribution and going all out, I need four times 40 gram hits of protein before you've even ensured that you're getting your minimum protein requirement over the course of the day. That's kind of, that's putting the horse before the cart. And so just prioritize the fundamentals first, i.e. hitting that minimum protein requirement. All right, so number, I don't know what number is, I think seven, creatine. Now you literally need five grams of creatine per day. Again, this is with a view to being able to retrain retain your strength whilst away so let's say you're going away for 30 days yeah and you take five grams of creatine per day that's 150 grams mate it's completely fuck all in terms of weight and space in your case i think people are sometimes scared of like getting banged up abroad and like you know all this crazy shit happening but it doesn't happen man i've taken creatine i've taken protein powder away to a lot of countries in like suspicious looking sandwich bags it's fine. I've never been locked up, man. I don't think you're going to be locked up either. So I think that's worth doing because it's it's very low effort and potentially high reward. Um, so that's definitely something that I would say is worth doing. All right, number eight, avoid full body splits. That is right. I said avoid. Avoid full body splits unless you're training very infrequently. So I think a lot of the time, as soon as people's training frequency drops, they're like, fuck, I need to get every muscle group ticked off. And so I'll just go to like full body workouts like twice a week or whatever. But the thing is, right, every time you group muscles together into one workout, what you're doing essentially is sacrificing some volume and intensity for training frequency, i.e. if I'm training every muscle group in my body, yeah, there's no way I'm going to be able to hit each of them with the same fucking ferocity the same volume and intensity as I would if I have them in smaller groups over a lot of different a lot of different workouts or a few different workouts. And so, of course, higher training frequency per muscle group is good, right? Of course, training a muscle group twice a week is better than training it once a week. But only if that training is with sufficient volume. It's only if basically there is enough stimulus on that muscle group to force adaptation now there's no point doing a full body workout if you're just doing like two sets of every of every body part of every muscle group and you go all right i've chick uh, you know I've, I've ticked biceps off so so they're done that's it that's me done for the week you know there's a reason why we don't do full body workouts six times a week and it's not because of recovery it's because it's just impossible to actually give each muscle group sufficient stimulus when you're trying to do one workout that encompasses the whole body so ultimately i just don't think that doing full body workouts is the best way to facilitate the maintenance of your strength all right another 
kind of obvious one is just use your time wisely in terms of your exercise selection. So single arm cable curls, they're just not on the agenda whatsoever, man. I, I would demote all isolations and everything to to once you've ticked off all your main compounds. Like let's say you're doing an upper lower split, you might be doing horizontal push pull and vertical push pull in one day. You're really not going to get much out of much else after those four big exercises, four big compounds there. And so I just don't think it's worth wasting your time on the smaller muscle groups, on isolation exercises and stuff like that. Of course, do them. If you have the time and energy, just definitely prioritize those big lifts, those compounds. All right, number, I think this is number 10. I think it's number 10, sleep. So this is a big one. Obviously, if you're going between different time zones and stuff, jet lag is a fucking bitch, man. Like, and if you're low on sleep, no amount of pre-workout is gonna save you. And so I think that it is best to try and get over that jet lag as quick as you possibly can. And I mean over it fully. And I think through my own experimentation, I always think the best way to do that is to power through the first day. And no matter how tired you are, no matter how weird shit gets, because shit get when you're super tired, shit gets fucking weird, man. Feel everything feels strange, man. But power through, and if you can wait until an actual like realistic appropriate time to go to bed for whatever time zone you're in you'll have a great sleep and wake up the next day and pretty much be over it in my experience that's how i get over jet lag the fastest and it's actually amazing that no matter how sleep deprived you are previously one good sleep can pretty much fix you uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure i've seen or heard about a study that was done on that as well but uh, i don't have it so all right that's 10 tips i think that's it ciao they see me rolling, they hating. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Lenny is my hero. Good. Hi everyone. So what I've done is I've created a basic PPL split and upper lower split, which will now be downloadable via the link in the description of this video. That will be live for a week from the date this was posted. I also re-uploaded the original bulking program that I've been following. That was way back from the first episode because a few people missed that. That will also be live for a week via the download link in the description. Whatever, go forward and make games with the free shirt. See you later, cheers.